Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting us. I'm Dorsa Sadig. I'm an assistant professor in robotics and computer science. And today you'll hear from me and Dan Yamins, who's also an assistant professor in psychology and is also associated with the Neuroscience Institute at, Stan at Stanford. Here is also the rest of our team. And today I want to talk about playful agents. So when we think of children, children have this amazing ability to learn through play. They, they tend to take these, these actions, they, they seem extremely satisfied taking these very complex and very subtle actions interacting with objects or other humans around them. And through these interactions, they're learning so much about the world, about the humans and everyone basically around them. So, um, so, so um, yeah, so, 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 for example, in this case, like you see this child putting this block on top of the other block, and through this interaction, it, the child is basically learning a very flexible, a general purpose task that can be applied to other settings. So, for example, the child can interact with other, other children or with other humans later using this set of skills. And that's very powerful. If you think about it, these children are very flexible when it comes to these things. And the thing is, we don't really know how this happens. We don't really know how children play. We don't really know how they learn through play. And this is still a mystery in cognitive science, which we are motivated by. And if you think about robots, robots in contrast are actually very different. They're very inflexible. Even the most advanced, most sophisticated robots that we have today look something like this. They're, they're very good at doing the same task over and over again. They're, they're optimized to do this one thing very effectively, very repeatedly. But when it comes to general purpose things, when it comes to uh, uncertain environments or new environments, they can't really deal with that. They don't really know how to deal with that. And if you think about it, when they're not working, they're just turned off. They're not learning. They're not intrinsically motivated. And in some sense, you can say, well, robots don't know how to play. But if you want these robots to, to drive our cars or, or interact with us in our everyday lives, like in our homes, they should be better than this. They should be more flexible than this. And, and similarly, going back to the idea of children, like if you think about children, like not all children learn the same way. If you think about play behavior, play behavior is actually often different in, in children on the autism spectrum. And, and they tend to t do repetitive tasks or, for example, ignore the differences between the objects, the different purposes that different objects can have. For example, in this, in this video, we have this child who's, who's on the spectrum, and, and she's playing with her toys. She, she has these dishes, these different dishes, and she's trying to line them up in, in, in one line, and she's not using the specific purpose of, of these uh, set of dishes. So let's look at the video. She doesn't have any problem grasping them. She doesn't have any problem recognizing the object, but just the play behavior is different. And, and you see her sister coming here, and her sister is actually doing a different thing. She's, she's putting the lid on top of the bowl, and, and she's trying to actually, the, the child doesn't like that, actually tries to put the lid back in the row and, and repeat this task of putting all these objects right next to each other and not using the specific purpose that the other child was trying to use. Which is, which is an interesting behavior that we still have no idea why that is the case. We still don't know these symptoms and, and how, how these symptoms actually relate to, the, to a set of all these other symptoms we see in, in ASD children. And that's also another motivation of this project. So our Catalyst team thinks that these three different phenomena, this, this development of childs in play and, and human-robot interaction and these atypical behaviors that we see in, in children on, on, on the ASD spectrum, they're all coming together through, through a fundamental, kind of fundamental reason. And the core idea that we have through this is, is, is that children, um, uh, yeah. so is that we can think of children as curiosity-driven, self-aware agents that interact in this rich environment. So these intrinsically motivated uh, agent-based models is kind of the common thinking that all of us from all these different departments, from all these different fields, have about all these different, the, the agents that, that we think of in this setting. So you can think of our agent living in a world, in an environment, and the agent tries to perceive the world through its sensors, let's say through vision, and the agent could be, could be a child or it could be uh, a robot. And, and the robot or the child acts also on the world, tries to change the world. So in some sense, we have this perception action loop. And the two fundamental questions we are trying to answer here is about perception and action. So more specifically about perception, we want to understand how the child is making a sense of all these complex sensory information that it is getting. 
Like, how does it know what an object is? How does it differentiate between animate agents and inanimate objects? And similarly, we have a very similar question when it comes to AI and robotics. We want to understand how robots and how autonomous agents need to autonomously see and understand what they're seeing. And similarly, from, from an action perspective, we are interested from a psychology perspective, specifically about the question that how are these children actually motivated? Like, how do they know what is interesting to look at? How do they know what is interesting to pick up and play with? And again, from robotics perspective, we have a very similar question, which is try to understand what are these optimal strategies, optimal actions that we should take in interactive goal learning for robots. And the big challenge here for both the robot and the human is the uncertainty that exists around our world or around our, our environment. So, so to hope with that, we are, we are trying to um, equip our, our system, our, our, our agent, with, with two uh, structures, two thinking structures. One is a world model and one is a self model. And the goal of the world model is to, is to uh, learn to predict the environment the system lives in. And specifically, the physical consequences that the agent has on, on the environment. And that self model is actually interesting. The, the goal of the self model is to learn to predict the world model itself. It's our self knowledge. It's our knowledge of what are my capabilities? Like what can I do and what can I not do? What are my limitations? And it's changing all the time too. So through the, these world model and self model and the driving force that exists between them, we are defining a notion that's called curiosity principle. So the notion of curiosity principle is that self model can direct the agent to interesting tasks that the world model doesn't even have an idea of, that the world model doesn't even understand yet. So, so basically, in other words, if my self knowledge, my knowledge of myself, my self awareness is going to slowly challenge me towards more and more interesting situations, and that can create this virtuous perception action loop. And this virtuous perception action loop creates this curiosity through which gives rise to learning. And with that learning, we can lead to even more curious, more, more inform, informed curiosity in, in, the, in this setting. And that can go on and we, keep, we can keep going. And, and really the central glue that brings these interdisciplinary research together is, is the, the existence of this curious self-aware interactive agent, which is the core idea behind all our thinkings. So if you're right, if this exists, we're going to have a few outcomes. So the first outcome is actually an engineering outcome. So if you can actually implement curious self-aware interactive agents in, in robots, that would be really awesome because we can have flexible, social, and interactive robots that can, intera that can work with us and collaborate with us in our everyday lives. And parallel to this, we also have two scientific hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is that if we can implement this curious self-aware uh, software agent, that can be a computation model for how typical children develop through play. And then the second hypothesis is actually similar to the first one. It's just turned around on its head. When, when, when we are trying to implement these self-aware uh, agents, these curious and self-aware agents, we, we obviously will fall into some, some, uh, some failure modes. And these failure modes could correspond to situations where we are balancing between exploration and, let's say, social attention. And, and our idea is these failure modes, along all the advances that we see, we see in ASD literature, m might give us some insight about, about these atypicalities that we see in ASD children. So now I'm going to switch to Dan, who is going to talk about our team. Um, actually, Great, thanks, Dorza. Um, so um, our team consists of myself, uh, Fei Fei Li, a computer vision expert, Dorsa Sadig, a roboticist, Dennis Wall, an autism expert, and Michael Frank, a developmental psychologist. Um, and together we're positioned reasonably well to start really attacking the uh, sort of core idea that we just talked about. So in particular, I'll tell you a little bit about each of our work. Um, working with Fei Fei, uh, in my group, we've built um, a deep neural network instantiation of a simple version of this self-aware um, curious agent. In particular, um, one which has these two components, the world model and the self model, implemented and learning together in an immersive, rich, three-dimensional um, physical environment. It turns out really interestingly that that type of object, that type of um, agent, is able to um, develop really interesting naturalistic behaviors all on its own. First it learns, for example, to understand its own motion, it, that is, it's able to learn about ego motion. Having done that, it naturally starts um, getting bored of moving around just by itself and starts paying attention to objects. As it pays attention to objects, it gets really good at predicting what happens with single objects, um, and then it gets bored 
again with that, and by virtue of that, um, start seeking out more interesting stuff, and in particular, making in objects interact, gathering and making objects interact with each other. You know, you imagine like a baby um, whacking things together, as they often do, to see what will what, what happen. Um, one of the most interesting results of this um, is that these kinds of observations actually arise in a stereotyped developmental milestone way, kind of like you might imagine it actually happening in real children. Um, <clears throat> so this is proof of principle that curiosity-driven self-aware agents can spontaneously generate naturalistic play behaviors. Um, but a crucial thing that's missing is a social component. In other words, we don't have other agents in the system, right? Of course, in the real world, there are many other agents in the system that's driving a lot of the learning. So one of our core next steps is going to be integrating into the agents the ability to model not just the self, but others. In other words, from the point, from the point of view of the cognitive science literature, theory of mind. Um, <clears throat> moving into Dorsa's group, what she's been doing is really interesting and complementary. And in particular, um, <clears throat> what she's found is that if you are, for example, an autonomous robot that wants to cut in front of another car, you shouldn't just do it. You should actually nudge first, and by nudging, what you find out is the state of mind of the other driver. That is, are they attentive or are they not? And by being able to separate the distracted human from the attentive human, not only do you have a model of their internal state, which is critical to understanding what they're going to do, um, but you're also much better at making plans compared to agents that are just implementing a kind of passive information gathering strategy. So this is really great, um, but what we will need to do next is generalize this to more sophisticated human-robot interactions like the ones that we were just looking at. Okay, so those two pieces of algorithms together combine um, to give a framework for how we want to approach this problem from an engineering perspective. Um, but from a uh, experimental perspective, we're really interested in gathering um, large-scale data and being able to compare the results of our algorithms to those experimental data. In particular, if you look at work being done in Michael Frank's group, it's a perfect fit. What he's been doing um, is been using head-mounted infant cameras to measure all kinds of data as infants do things over the course of their development. You know, what do they look at? What do they do? Where do they move? Okay, and by combining this, this um, egocentric data um, with um, state-of-the-art machine learning tools to be able to extract key observables, like when do they have a face detection, when is there a hand detection, what their pose and position is. Um, what that allows you to do, what that allows Mike to do, is build really um, powerful, quantified, um, reliable learning curves and milestones of exactly what's developing by how much and when. So this is really great, powerful data, um, but what it's missing is a key unknown, which is why are the curves the way they are? In other words, what is the under learning lear underlying learning principle that's driving these patterns? Um, now, we don't know exactly what they are yet, but um, not coincidentally, these are exactly the types of observables that are predicted by the type of models that I mentioned a moment ago. So our core idea, and one that we're just about to be able to do as we start to build in um, social component to our modeling, is to be able to compare the type of data that comes out of the neural network models with the actual observations of real children. Um, looking at the work in Dennis Wall's group, um, he, we see that he, what he's doing is a really complementary and expanded version of this in the context of the autism spectrum cohort. Um, so in particular, um, what he's really been involved with is making devices that are lightweight and that are able to both collect information about and potentially deliver therapeutics for folks um, on the autism spectrum. So in this particular case, he's developed the autism glass, which is a Google Glass device on which they've um, developed um, um, using modern um, machine learning technology, software for a facial recognition, expression recognition. And that facial expression recognition allows them to deliver to uh, ASD children uh, information about what they're seeing and why that potentially helps them learn about and handle social cues. Um, and there's, there's, uh, the autism glass is in the midst of a pilot clinical trial um, and uh, with participants from all over California making actually the largest um, data set of head-mounted um, uh, data, um, uh, uh, interactive data from children on the spectrum. Um, so this is really powerful data, um, but <clears throat> what we really see, think is important here is that um, while things like facial expression recognition are, um, are important uh, um, indicators, they're very likely to be um, just one, one type of specific uh, symptom that comes quite late um, in autism development and not necessarily exactly where the root causes are. Right? On the other hand, what's coming out of the autism literature is clear indication that some of those root causes have to do with the interaction between low-level visual processing and attentional control, which are exactly the ingredients that go into um, both our computational modeling and also the data that we're collecting from the point of view of 
um, of the normal children, you know, normally developing children. Um, so our goal is to move from software for facial expression recognition to software that delivers online feedback, um, you know, promoting curiosity and self-awareness. Um, you know, if successful, what we'll be able to get from this is, um, you know, obviously uh, algorithms that are able to do better work for socially aware robots. Um, in addition to very valuable data from both normally developing and atypically developing children, um, even if those two things don't mesh, they're very valuable by themselves. You know, more powerful ro robotic algorithms and that data are really, you know, obviously valuable goals. If we can get them to mesh, then we really have a, um, a chance at building um, much more powerful next generation wearable uh, diagnostic and therapeutic devices. Um, so um, with that, um, would everybody come up and uh, we can answer some questions as needed. Uh, here, here you can see a robot playing, so. All right. Uh, so, thanks. This is fascinating, by the way. <laughs> it's really fantastic. Um, the ability to learn curiosity, is it defined as exploration of the world model? Like, for example, would you do a reinforcement learning adversarial kind of thing where if you find something new, that's rewarded and that inherently is synonymous with creativity? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. You're basically asking what is the underlying like loss function that's being used to drive the curiosity cycle. There's a couple of things that you can do. Um, one thing that you can do is actually the simplest thing, which is what we're doing and which is something that you basically keyed onto, which is having the world model and the self model be adversarial. In other words, the self model, by understanding what the world model knows, tries to pick actions that are really challenging for the world model. It doesn't know how to solve them, but it knows that if it focuses on that, it'll learn something interesting. There are other things that you could do. There are actually more sophisticated ideas. You could actually try to have the system measure and predict how much additional incremental learning you could get from any given action and then try to maximize that. That's like information gain, it me measures. Um, I think our point of view is, is that any of those are interesting ideas and so there's actually a sort of spectrum of like particular loss functions you could plug into the core of the curious self-aware self agent and then maybe different versions of that will lead to different behavior, and actually that will be where our failure mode analysis comes in, which is basically, um, if we implement the wrong thing there, we're very likely to get the wrong attentional behavior. And actually we see that already in our, you know, it turns out to be fairly challenging to get the balance of an adversarial system to work. You know, often one component will overcome another one um, in a way that's sort of pathological and lead to, you know, strange um, behavior effectively. And, you know, of course our behavior is much stranger now than, you know, um, then you know, the, our, our agents are you know, not there yet. Um, but what we think is, is that if we're able to implement more, more interesting versions of just the kind of ideas that you're mentioning, we'll have a spectrum of differences that um, potentially lead to you know, the ability to characterize this type, of, this type of unusual play behavior versus that type of unusual social behavior and so forth. So I don't know how to rule out exactly which one it is yet, but there's a, a nice spectrum of ideas of how to, how to make the sort of world and self-modeling connect to each other, world self and other modeling connect, yeah. Are there any other questions? Maybe just picking up on the autism case. So the, they'll actually be getting feedback in this Google Glass, or sorry, this autism glass case, and they'll uh, be able to be, have emotions interpreted to them. And then how do you follow if they're acting on it properly and, and that sort of thing? Do you, do you measure outcomes somehow as part of that? Uh, guess, and how do you do that? Thanks for the question. Yeah, we, we're, we have outcome measures that we will be utilizing to determine gains. I think the key thing that, uh, that's at the intersection between the work that we're doing and, and these adversarial models that Dan's describing is our ability to identify deviations from the normal developmental trajectory that are, that are like the deviations you see in autism. And the goal is to drive down the average age of detection of those deviations to a point where we can actually intervene earlier earlier, in fact, than we can with these glasses. So right now, we can take with the learnings that we've developed, the models we've developed for <clears throat> therapeutic intervention and data acquisition simultaneously through the glass wearable, and start to drive the information down in age so that we can find deviations far sooner than we can today. Yeah, I'd add to that, it's like, you know, um, if you actually look at the data um, from you know, egocentric cameras, it's actually fairly challenging to figure out 
um, what those deviations are. They're, they're something that a trained observer can see, but they're actually pretty challenging to figure out. And so what we really hope comes out of the formal computational models that can um, generate those behaviors is also the ability to characterize sort of formally the, and you know, in a kind of automatedly calculatable way from the video data, the um, observables that allow us to drive that, that, that age of detection earlier. You know, so in other words, you put a very simple lightweight device on, um, on a child um, who you know, might be at risk, um, a couple of days of observation, and then you have a much better like, picture of what's really going on there. Um, you know, and that, you know, the, the earlier you can intervene, the better. So. Okay, well unfortunately for timing, we'll have to stop now. So thank you again for the presentation.